morning again, everyone. We're very, very glad to share with you today again to visitors in different countries of the world, uh, watching on Facebook or on YouTube as well. You're very, very welcome. So let's just pray for those words. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask this morning that by your grace and tender mercies, you would visit us this morning in the presence of your Spirit and speak to us through your living and active word. Lord, we love your word. And we ask, Lord, please, that in its power, it would set us free. Lord Jesus, you spoke to your disciples a word that resounds down to this very day. If you continue in my word, you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So this morning, Lord, we ask you, please, set us free by the living, active, powerful word of God at work in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. But we're looking at the person of the devil and his opposition to God and his saints. And we're learning how God provides Christians with many, not just a few, with many spiritual weapons in our holy war against the devil. And that's what it is. It's a holy war. God is wanting his people to walk in holiness. And as you walk in holiness, you defeat the devil, because the devil's job is to rob God of glory and to rob you of God's blessings. So if he can get you to walk in on holiness, he is fulfilling his purpose. It's a holy word. And although the word of God was saying this a couple of weeks ago, no, no, pardon me, the word of God is the single most powerful weapon when it is combined with prayer. It is an awesome, formidable force against the enemy. So the word of God, the Bible, is the most powerful weapon that God gives his people against the powers of hell. But another weapon is prayer. And when you combine the word of God and prayer together, it is a formidable force against the enemy. And we saw last week how Elijah demonstrated the power of the word of God and prayer combined. When he prayed to God to keep his word, this was the thing. He knew what God said. He asked God to keep his word and asked him, withhold the rain. Because Israel had been deceived by the devil into sin and disobedience and were worshipping false gods. And God had said, and Elijah, you know, God had said, if Israel sins, this was what he spoke to Moses to tell the people of Israel before they moved across uh, the Jordan into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, God told Moses, tell the people that if they sin against me, if their hearts are deceived and led astray and become disobedient, I will withhold the rain. And so Elijah prayed the word of God into the situation and God answered Elijah's prayer and we know from James that the drought lasted for three and a half years. However, when the Israelites confessed their sin and repented, Elijah prayed and it rained again. The word of God and prayer combined is a destructive force against the devil. But the Apostle James reminds us, uh, reminds us of something wonderful. He tells us, look, he says, Christian in 2021, here in this hall in Skipperstone Road, or those who are watching it on Facebook or on YouTube, he's saying, look, Elijah wasn't anyone special. Elijah was a person just like us. Jesus tells us he had a similar nature to us. He was a Christian living in a sin-cursed body in a sin-cursed world. He was a believer in that sense, not a Christian. He was a believer living in a sin-cursed body in a sin-cursed world. And so Christian, the lessons that we could learn from that account are these, that just like Elijah, we need to have a personal relationship with God if we want to see these weapons working effectively. We need to know the word of God and we need to be a people of prayer, knowing how to pray. It is no good you praying stupid prayers that are contrary. So I remember one woman one night sitting here in the meeting, prayed and said, Lord, please, you know, you know I've bought a lottery ticket this week. Is there any chance that I could, I'm serious. I was flabbergasted. I was like, well, maybe Lord, you know, if she Keep out of my hurry, you know. Because <laughs> you never know. You know. But that was the sort of thing, you know, it's not, that's not the will of God. You have to be a 
people who know what the Word of God says so that you know how to pray the Word of God back. So, for example, if you know that the Word of God says, I'm saying this, I think, on Wednesday night, if you know that the Word of God says that this promise of salvation, repent and believe so that you shall receive forgiveness of sins, and this promise of salvation is for you and your household. Well, then you know that the Word of God says that, so you can go back into your prayer time with God and say, God, you said that if my family also will believe and repent and believe and trust in Jesus, that they too will be saved. Therefore, I'm asking you to fulfill your word and give them the faith that they need to believe in Jesus. Amen. That is the Word of God that you are behind. That's how you're going to see your loved ones sealed. So we need to have that personal relationship with the Lord. We need to know the Word of God and be people of prayer and knowing how to pray. But we must, this is so important, we must apply the Word of God and prayer in our own lives. The nice way of putting it is, you need to practice what you preach. If you are not practicing what you preach, do you ever go to your firework display and you get all excited and you see the we were to light this firework and just go, Then you're looking for all of this great thing in the sky. This is what happens when you think that you can live as you please, when you think as a Christian you can do what you like because all of your sins are forgiven and God doesn't like. In fact, God understands my weakness. When you come up with all of the lies and believe the lies that the devil tells you, you are a damp squib when it comes to the word of God in prayer. You ask, why is God not going to my prayers? How about stop sinning yeah. and walk in holiness? So we have to be a people who practice what we preach. We must learn how to combine these weapons against the devil's deceitfulness. And again, as I said, it is only through our own personal relationship with Jesus that he can train our hands for work. If you are not in the Word of God, if you are not under the Word of God, if you are not fellowshipping with other believers, if you are not spending time alone with God in your own secret place, prayer time, whatever you want to call it, then Jesus cannot train your hands for war. As I said, God provides Christians with many spiritual weapons in their own home battles against the devil. And some of these we'll be looking at briefly over the next few weeks. I'm hoping to get the devil series finished by the end of November. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to. So, the, the, the Protestant reformer Martin Luther, former Catholic priest Martin Luther, lived through various waves of the Black Death or the bubonic plague epidemic. So there's nothing new under the sun. We're going through the COVID pandemic. He was living through the Black Death or the bubonic plague epidemic. And it is believed, it is believed that through his trials, now his trials included watching and witnessing loved ones becoming sick with the bubonic plague, friends and neighbors dying and personally experiencing times of great suffering and affliction. It was in these times that Luther wrote the great hymn that we sang this morning, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And I would say, as I was thinking about it this morning, I would say to anyone, go on to Google and get the lyrics when you're at home of A Mighty Fortress is Our God and use it for one week Use the words of that song for one week as your prayer uh, motivation and see that out of great, great suffering, he wrote this incredible hymn. We also sang, when peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul. I wonder if you could sing that this morning. Mm. But do you actually sing it when you're going through a difficult time in your life? Because what God is trying to teach us is this. Look, it doesn't matter like the hymn said. It doesn't matter if all of hell is unleashed against us and pulls us apart limb from limb and kills the body in as well with my soul because of Jesus. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, whatever situation you're going through, whatever difficulty, whatever struggle, whatever disease is coming against you, God has said, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. 
Nice yeah. hymn, isn't it? Yes. You see, this hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, was written by Horatio Spafford, who had made plans to visit Europe with his family, but he had kept, he'd have held up in work, and so he decided to send his wife and his four daughters on ahead, planning to, to meet up with them later. And as their ship was crossing the Atlantic, their ship collided with another vessel, and it sank, and all four daughters, all Spafford's four daughters, drowned, and his wife survived. And later, while he was traveling to join his wife, the captain of the boat said, this is the area where the ship went down, and it was there that Spafford wrote to him, it is well with my soul. He had lost his four daughters, but he knew it was well with their souls. How incredible. See, we just sing the songs. But there's great suffering and great trial and great heartache that brought that to birth. And there are many stories of hymns and songs of prayers written out of times of great, great trial and suffering which have been sung by others in their times of tribulation and hardship. And many, many people over the years have taken great comfort from amazing grace how sweet the sound that, that he, will, he will bring me safely home. Yeah. Let me ask you this morning then, Christian, do your trials, do your sufferings, do the challenges that you face in life, do they produce in you a hymn of praise? Do they produce in you an act of worship? Let's turn this morning, please, to Psalm 18. And I'm going to read the first 19 verses. Psalm 18. David says these words. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surround me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. And he roamed upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, the foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he delivered me from the straw, from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. You know, some years ago, you remember Billy, I don't know if you remember, but some years ago, Right at the unit, it used to be where the shops were at Whitehill. Uh, there was a crowd, it was a night time, uh, there was a crowd had gathered for a confrontation with the police. Now, I can't remember if it was Drum Cree or what it was, but there was, a, there was a, a massive crowd up at the shops had gathered, and all the peers were down, I told this story before, all the peers were down there on, on the green. Um, and it was getting really difficult, it was, you know, Tents and people were coming out of their houses to watch to see what was going on, uh, and, and others were near up, bored up their knees. You know, so they were so scared. I mean, it was it was bad. And of course, I was there, but I was I was just an innocent bystander. <laughs> <laughs> I was just loitering nearby, wanting to give out tracks. <laughs> the, the atmosphere was really, really tense. I mean, it was bad. 
heightened by the fact that suddenly all the street lights went off, plunging the area into complete darkness. And then one of the RUC land rovers, they turned on this powerful spotlight and they shot it at the potential rioters. Well, seeing this as his Andy Warhol 15 minutes of fame, one guy stripped off his shirt and bare chested walked out into the light and sang, There may be trouble, <laughs> but there's moonlight and music and love and romance. Let's face the music and dance. And the whole place just rup- erupted with laughter. The RUC were laughing. And the riot, potential rioters were laughing, the onlookers were laughing, there was so much laughter, and it was so incredible that the episode actually, the very fact that he sang this song, and it was so funny, it actually prevented any serious escalation. I mean, who would have thought that a simple song in such perfect timing, such perfect timing, would diffuse such a very, very dangerous situation. Do you know, I recall hearing vaguely, Billy Morrison might be able to put me right in this book, I remember hearing that one of the Methodist brothers, either John or Charles Wesley, I don't know which one, but they actually wrote a collection of songs entitled, not Christian hymns, it was songs entitled, Hymns to be Sung in the Midst of a Tumult. Hymns to be sung in the midst of a riot. Now, I can see you ever going out in the midst of a riot and saying stand up, stand up for Jesus, or whatever else. Or, you know, bottles fired, pepper bombs going, the police having to shoot plastic bullets. And, you know, hymns to be sung, let's just get the hymn book. Hymns to be sung in the midst of a riot. Well, the book of Psalms, pardon me, the book of Psalms is a collection of 150 songs of praise worship and thanksgiving to God. And many of these psalms or songs, they were forged in the furnace of hard trials and they have been sung by Christians in similar circumstances for generations. So for example, think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd and that has brought so much comfort to so many people going through very, very difficult times. But who would have thought for a moment that praise, worship and thanksgiving would be among the weapons that God has given to his people to help resist the devil and cause him to flee. Did you realize that, Christian? Did you realize that praise, worship, and thanksgiving are powerful weapons that God has? Not something he's going to give you. He has given you. Do you know what it talks about? He put a new song in my heart, he put a new song in my mouth, all of that, that is God saying, I've already given you this. Praise, worship, and thanksgiving are powerful weapons that God has given to his people to help resist the devil and to cause him to flee. And so I was looking over the week um, in the darkest days so far in my Christian life. And hymns like, O oh Jesus, friend, unfailing, show me, show me thy face, one transient gleam, or the beautiful hymn, Thou Hidden Source of Calm Repose. These, among others, have been for me a source of strength and comfort in my most difficult days. These hymns actually inspire me to seek the Lord, to press myself into Him, and to find Him, uh, to find Him in my troubles. And as I do, very often, what I find is, I discover that things are put into perspective or I simply find the strength to keep going on. Sometimes when the devil attacks Christians the the, the Psalms talk about the Lord, talk about the troubles, saying that the enemy comes in and he magnifies our troubles. So what may be a small trouble, he comes with a magnifying glass and he blows it out of all proportion. But praise and worship and thanksgiving help us to get things into perspective and to find the strength in the Lord to keep pressing on. So just out of curiosity, just quickly, does anybody here have a particular hymn that they cling to at all times and that has been a source of strength and comfort to them? God is good all the time. God is good all the time. 
Hag Hi, all is well, my soul. All is well, my soul. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Say, oh, everybody has something when you think about it that that it's a song. It's it's a it's something that's meaningful to you. It helps you in your difficult times. It helps you face your struggles. My my hands, as I said, they inspire me to press myself into Jesus. Praise, worship, and thanksgiving are God-given weapons that a Christian can use to help us against the devil's onslaught, which at times comes in like a flood of temptation, of deceit, of discouragement, seeking to overwhelm us. Praise, worship, and thanksgiving can be a solace, they can be a comfort to our souls, or they can lift us up out of the pit of despair and despondency where the enemy seeks to hold us captive. It is the enemy's job to keep us in the pits of misery. It is the enemy's job to keep us in the pit of despondency. It is the enemy's job to keep us overwhelmed with fear, to keep us overwhelmed with anxiety, to keep us overwhelmed with all of the things that take our eyes off Jesus. Remember, the devil always seeks to deceive, to dupe, to entice, and to seduce us away from God, to rob God of glory and us of God's blessing. And he will use doubt. He will use fear. He will use depression. He will use mental illness. He will use everything that he can possibly use. He will use even the weapons that we give him to use against us, our own sinful desire. He will do whatever he has to do to get our eyes off Jesus and to be fixed and held captive in the pit of despondency. Praise, worship, and thanksgiving helps us to refocus, to get our perspective right, and to press on in our walk with Jesus. But you know, these weapons, it's not all about shielding us from the devil. Ooh, it's not all about that. These weapons can also be used to take the offensive against the devil. David was pursued by King Saul, who wanted him dead, because Saul saw David as a threat to his room. And David's life was often at risk. We just read the Psalms and think, aren't they really nice? But you know, many of them that were written by David were written out of the furnace of hard trials. David's life was often at risk, not only from his enemies, but even members of his own family wanted him dead, and his closest friends wanted him dead. And through his struggles, through his hardships, through all of his sufferings, David still looked to God and call out to the Lord for help and deliverance. And God never failed him. And we know that many of the songs of praise and of worship and of thanksgiving that David had written, they were written on reflection. They were written in hindsight. Once God had delivered him from his enemies, he was able to write these songs. But when you look at the songs that he had written, when you look at the Psalms, they show David standing on the truth of God's word as he resisted his enemies. And let me be absolutely clear this morning. You are not going to be able to resist the devil in your own word. Yeah. You are not going to be able to resist the devil in your own strength. You need to apply the word of God. I listen to Christians and I can't be bothered reading my Bible. You're a fool. You are an idiot. Even though the Bible says call no one a fool, I'm telling you, if you do not do what God's word says, you are extremely foolish. You cannot resist the devil in your own strength. You cannot resist him by your own word. If you do not apply the word of God, if you do not apply prayer, if you do not apply and use the weapons that God has given you, you're no good on earth. You'd be better off dead. You'd be better off saying, Lord, take me home because I don't want to fight anymore. I don't, I don't want to do this. Or you will just be defeated or your whole life will be spent in the pit of despondency. Yeah. Yeah. God's not going to do it all. He expects you to take some responsibility as well. 
David knew the Lord. He knew him personally. He described him as we saw. He said, he is my rock. He is my fortress. He is my deliverer. He is my strength and my shield. When you read it, when you sing it, what it is, it's praise to God. In the midst of everything that he was going, here's what he said. Lord, you are my rock. You are the sure foundation. If you shake, if my old life tumbles down, then I have nothing else to live for. You are my fortress. I try to hide myself in you for your protection. You are my deliverer. I'm looking to you to save me, to rescue me. You are my strength. I can't do this on my own. Will you please uphold me? You are my shield. Will you protect me from all of the fiery darts of the evil one? David is saying out, he is declaring that he trusted in God to rescue and deliver him. And when the Lord saved him, David worshipped and rejoiced with thanksgiving and wrote songs for us yes. to benefit from. Look at what he says in verse 3 of 18. David sang, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Who knows that song? Who actually sings it like it's a prayer? I will call upon the Lord He delivered me. 
because he delighted in the Christian. That's you this morning. David, in the midst of all of his trials and all of his uh, heartache and all of his sufferings, he was able to record this song for future generations to say this morning that David was standing here. He was saying, this is for you this morning. This is for you this morning. He delivered me because he delighted in me, Christian. That is how God views you this morning. He delights in you, whatever. It doesn't matter how bad and how many yes, times in the week that you have let God down, he delights in you. Yes. It doesn't matter if you're on the mountaintop lifting hands, praising and worshiping, or if you're feeling like you're in the pit of despondency. He delights in you. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. And God will shake, as you see, he will shake heaven and earth to come to your rescue. Why? Yes. Because he delights in you this morning. Christian, praise, worship, and thanksgiving are weapons given by God to help us resist the devil and take the offensive against the, his attacks on our hearts and on our minds. How many of us have been feeling a bit down and then we put on a wee praise CD yeah. or a worship CD and suddenly we find ourselves lifted? Or we're feeling a bit miserable because of maybe we've given in to temptation and sin and we're beating ourselves up. And then the wee words of the song come into our mind or into our minds and we start singing them and before we know it, we've lifted up. See the weapons are beginning to work. We've got to take the offensive against the devil's attacks on our minds and our hearts. Praise, worship, and thanksgiving help us fix our eyes on the Lord as we look to him for his help. And because he loves us, because he delights in us, he will move heaven and earth to save us and to cause our enemies to flee. It's true. Praise, worship, and thanksgiving can not only diffuse the enemies of souls, but they can also raise us up to a higher place out of the pits of despair and despondency. Praise, worship, and thanksgiving. And this is so important. Praise, worship, and thanksgiving are not just about us in our sufferings proclaiming into the heavens, reaching the throne room of God. And that's what we're doing. We're saying, you are my rock. You're the very reason that I'm alive. If that rock shakes, I shake. You are my fortress. I hide myself in you. You are my deliverer. I'm looking to you, oh God. I'm asking you please to rescue me, to save me. You are my strength. You're proclaiming it into the heaven, heavenlies, into the very throne room of God. You are my strength. I can't do this without you. I need you to uphold me. You are my shield. Please protect me from all of these wiles, all of these schemes, all of these fiery darts of the evil one that is coming against me. You're saying, Lord, I'm proclaiming into the heavens that you alone are my God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. But you're not only proclaiming into the heavenlies, you're not only proclaiming into the throne room of God, they are a declaration onto your very soul. You are saying to your very soul, God is my rock. Oh soul, trust in God who is my rock. Oh my soul, in the midst of these troubles, trust in God who is my fortress. Oh soul, in all of this trial and tribulation, look to God who is my deliverer, my saviour, my rescuer. Look to God who is my strength. Look to God who is my shield. That is, it's a declaration to your soul. And as you declare the truths of God to your soul, your soul gets strengthened in the midst of all of your trials. And we know that even some of you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, how Christian men and women were walking out to be burned at the stake. And even while they were burning, singing hymns, never mind hymns to be sung in the midst of a riot. What about hymns to be sung in the midst of the flames that are burning you to death? And yet these people had the grace. Why? Because they proclaimed into the heavenlies, God, I trust in you. And a declaration to their souls, I will trust in God, my Savior. Praise, worship, and thanksgiving help us to refocus, to get our perspective.
in Jesus, yes. my Lord and my Savior. Yes. Maybe this morning there's someone here and they're not yet a Christian, someone watching in on Facebook or on YouTube. Well, I need to tell you that you have spiritual enemies. Just as the Christian has, you have spiritual enemies. The problem that you have is that you're already a slave to Satan and to sin and to death. But Christians know and love the Lord. And we can call upon the name of the Lord to save us out of our troubles. But to whom will you call to save you from the deceit of the devil? Well, it's good news to know that God loves you. He delights in you this morning. And he sent his son Jesus to die for you, to destroy the works of the devil in your life and over your life. Yes. God wants to save you from sin and from the devil. But like David, you too must call upon the Lord. Yes. Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be saved from the devil or Satan? Do you want to be saved from sin, from death, and from hell. But I simply do as God says. Confess your sin. That means agree with God that you are a sinner. Repent. Turn around from your sin. Turn away from your sin. And put your trust in Jesus. And in Jesus alone to save you. In doing so. May your heart therefore. Resign. In praise. In worship. And in thanksgiving. Unto the Lord. That's right. Lord, how wonderful to know that we have these wonderful, powerful weapons of praise, of worship, and of thanksgiving. And many Christians, Lord God, can tell of being in times of great depression, times of great misery, times of great heart, heartache and struggle and suffering. And they could sing songs that drew them closer to you. That they could sing songs of praise and worship and thanksgiving that help them to refocus and to get their eyes fixed on the Lord. And you, Lord God, put things into perspective. And even in the midst of all of their struggles, they were able to say, It is well with my soul. Lord, thank you that every Christian who knows you and loves you has that promise today. That it doesn't matter if all hell should come against us. It doesn't matter if the whole world comes against us and even destroys us, kills us. It is well with my soul because our hope is in Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour. Lord, thank you that we continually call upon the name of the Lord and you are worthy to be praised. And so shall we be saved from our enemies. The greatest enemy of all that we have to face, Lord, is death. But even death has been defeated for those who trust in Jesus. Because you told us that even though we die, yet shall we live. Lord, thank you for the hope that we have in you, for the faith that you give us to believe. May you train our hands for war and teach us how to use these weapons effectively. And I pray, Lord, for any unbeliever today. I ask Almighty God in the name of Jesus that you would help them to see that you love them, that you delight in them. That you sent Jesus to die for them. And Lord, if they would only do what you say, confess their sin, repent of their sin, and trust in Jesus your Son and in him alone for salvation, then they too will know what it is to be able to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Bless them, Father, please, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, draw them onto yourself. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.